Blend the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Hester. The king and Haman went into feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther, Esther answered, if I have won your favor, O king, and it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition. And the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. Then King Assyrius said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? Who has presumed to do this? Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose words save the king, stands at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hung Haman on the shallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated. Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in the, all the providence of King Assyrius, both near and far, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month, Adar, and also the 15th day of the same art, month, year by year, as the days on which the Jews gained relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness, and from mourning into a holiday, that they should be make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another, and presents to the poor. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 124. Please join me after the asterisk of each verse. If the Lord has not been on your side, let Israel now say. If the Lord has not been on our side, when enemies rose up against us, then would they have swallowed us up alive in their fierce anger towards us? Then would the waters have overwhelmed us and the torrent gone over us. Then would the raging waters have gone right above us. Blessed be the Lord. He has not given us over to be prey of their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our hope is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth.
reading of them. Our second reading is from James. Are there among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being just like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye 
than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So yesterday I was chatting with the bishop a little bit and I mentioned that I had to preach on the gospel where Jesus tells us to cut off our hands and feet and gouge out our eyes. Um, And she kind of laughed and said, yeah, sometimes that happens to new clergy. They get the really hard passages. Um, It's a little bit of hazing that clergy do. Um, I don't think that was Father Tom's intent. I think we just decided it was going to be fourth fourth Sunday. But, uh, you know, one wonders. (laughs) Today's gospel has at least two distinct parts, and there's a lot of metaphor um, and symbolism, I think, that needs a bit of unpacking. The the first part has the disciple John um, sort of coming and tattling on someone who is casting out demons in the name of Jesus, but he isn't a part of their group. He's not one of the disciples. Uh, And this comes right after, a week or two ago, they were arguing about which one of them is the greatest. Um, And now, they're all upset and complaining that someone else is taking credit for their work. And so you've kind of got to love the humanity of these disciples, right? Like, these are very human feelings that we all have sometimes. A little bit of jealousy and a little bit of, you know, thinking we're better. But Jesus' response is pretty quick and clear. Whoever is not against us is for us. And the other thing that sort of jars me a little bit is when I read about someone casting out demons is I immediately picture in my head an evil spirit or a mean monster and someone's literally like pulling that person out, pulling that demon out of somebody or grabbing that monster and like throwing them out of the room. Um, And that's not really particularly helpful for today's times. Um, And so I like to think of a demon a little bit differently, like What if a demon is just something that isn't God, that isn't from God, that doesn't point towards God? We may think of demons in today's language as maybe a kind of sickness, um, but it could really refer to all manner of things. Um, It could be referring to addiction, uh, racism, classism, nationalism, all those isms that cause us to other people Um, and separate them from us. And we do this a lot with our various Christian denominations. Like, I don't even know how many Christian denominations there are. A lot. Um, And part of... but, But we're all Christians, and we're just practicing in different ways. And so part of what this gospel is telling us is that we need to accept those who work in Jesus' name, but just not on our terms. We need to recognize that they're doing their best to interpret the scriptures and act on them in the way that they think is right and hope that they give us the same consideration. Jesus said, whoever is not against us is for us. It's pretty simply stated, but it's a lot harder to live out. And then we have the second part of the gospel, And Jesus starts off by talking about how we should not put stumbling blocks before the little ones who believe in him. And little ones might be referencing that little baby that he was holding whenever it was last week or the week before. 
Um, so literally a little one. Um, or it might be referring to a, a new Christian, someone who has recently come to the faith, who's recently started following Jesus. And if it's the latter, it could be a direct reference to that man above who was casting out the demons. Someone who can successfully cast out demons in the name of Jesus must be a true believer. So similarly today, we as Christians need to ponder our own failures of love, our distortions of the way of Christ, our too narrow understandings of the truth, our quickness to pronounce judgment, all the things that we may do to cause others to stumble as they are trying to find the way of faithful living. So the gospel really begins with this welcoming, opening attitude to those who work in the name of Christ and wanting to make sure that we include them. Um, but then it kind of goes another way. And Jesus lists out, if your hand, your foot, or your eye causes you to stumble, cut it off and be maimed rather than being thrown into hell. Well, threatening eternal damnation for someone does not seem incredibly welcoming and open, so it's kind of a, a 180. Um, and again, when I was talking to the bishop about this, the first thing she said was like, oh man, with everything going on with the Taliban right now, like that could have some interesting implications for a sermon. Um, and I'm not going to delve into that too deeply, but I thought it was an interesting reflection from the bishop to quickly respond in that way to think about how the Taliban might be using this scripture to justify what they're doing. And I also think of what I tell the youth at every youth event. Um, we talk about that you know, they have the right to feel safe um, and to not accept behavior that makes them really uncomfortable or that they think is inappropriate. Uh, but at the same time, they don't have the right to be negative in their rejection of that behavior, right? Like we want them to say, to be able to say in a Christian loving way, hey, that offends me and I please stop, right? Like, if someone hits you, you don't hit them back, you say, please don't hit me. <laughs> um, and so those are kind of the things that are ruminating in my mind a little bit in this passage. Uh, all the commentaries say I can't preach on this if I don't talk a little bit about hell, so we'll talk a little bit about hell. Again, one of those... <laughs> One of those ideas as Episcopalians that we have sort of a complicated relationship with, an excellent opportunity for the brand new preacher to preach. Father Tom, thank you. <laughs> um, but I did find out that we both looked at uh, Daniel Miglior. Is that how you say it? Miglior? Uh, he's a theologian that I read in seminary, um, and he has a great take on concept that take on the concept of hell that I just want to, to share with you. He says, hell is simply to be oneself apart from God's grace and in isolation from others. Hell is that self-chosen condition in which in opposition to God's agapic love and the call to a life of mutual friendship and service, individuals barricade themselves from others. Hell is not an arbitrary divine punishment at the end of history. It is not the final retaliation of a vindictive deity. Hell is self-destructive resistance to the eternal love of God. It symbolizes the truth that the meaning and intention of life can be missed. Repentance is urgent. Our choices and actions are important. God ever seeks to lead us out of our hell of self-glorification and lovelessness. But God won't coerce us. It's our choice. Our own selfishness to keep our hand, foot, or eye rather than follow God will determine the outcome.
As a metaphor, this idea of the hand, the foot, and the eye brought to mind Romans 12. Uh, And I'm sure all of you immediately know what I'm referring to, um, (laughs) but just in case you don't, the passage I'm mentioning is that, uh, for as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. So I think Jesus is not asking us to maim our literal bodies, but to beware people in our communities whose actions threaten the whole. And we're not really talking about someone who is simply annoying or awkward or angry or maybe lashing out. Um, When we look at the original meaning of the word that was translated stumble, so causing someone to stumble, it was something so horrifying that you could simply not remain in place or on the same path you were on. So here I think it's referencing actions or words that would divert someone from their faith or discipleship. So as a a callback to that first part of the passage, it's someone who is actively against us and what we believe in. The disciples are urged not to lose their distinctiveness, not to succumb to the pressures to adopt the standards and ethos of dominant social culture, and to thus remove that activity, thought, practice, or person which causes us to stumble, to stay true to being Christians and to following Christ. So it's kind of a weird balancing act, right? The first part of the passage is all this welcoming and inclusive and encouraging and don't obstruct the path for those who might follow Jesus. Um, But then there's this, but we also need to make sure we keep the integrity of our community and continue to follow Christ and, um, you know, have, have standards and rules that we can, we can say that we're abiding by. So how exactly are we supposed to do that? (laughs) And the thing that There's a little bit in the gospel that I want to talk about, but I also want to talk about this great James passage that's on this piece of paper up here. Um, It says, are any among you suffering, they should pray. Are any cheerful, they should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick, they should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. What a great guide for how to live as a Christian today, to pray for each other, to pray for yourself, to ask for help when you need it. It's interesting that it says if you're sick, it's your responsibility to call and tell someone that you're sick so that they can pray for you because that's what we do as a Christian family. And the gospel leaves us with this closing metaphor that's also confusing and full of metaphors. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. In the ancient world, salt was a precious commodity. They used it to preserve their food. They used it as a medicine. Um, It was required as part of the sacrificial offering. Uh, And eating salt with someone was a sign of friendship and loyalty. So if you have salt in yourself, instead of needing to rely on actual salt. What does that mean? It means you can be a sacrifice. You can be that sign of friendship. You can represent loyalty to God. Mark, in this gospel, is calling us to a ministry of hospitality and covenant loyalty. We can be welcoming and faithful, and we can be at peace with one another through these actions. Amen.
the prayers of the people are found in your booklet. Let us pray for the church and for the world. We give you thanks and praise, Lord Jesus Christ, that you have called us into your fellowship. For those who first taught us to pray and opened the gospel to us, we give you thanks. For those who stood with us at the font, we give you thanks. For the abundant grace of baptism by which we were granted forgiveness and a place in the kingdom, we give you thanks. For the faith we confessed in the creed and the call we accepted in the baptismal covenant, we give you thanks. For the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the sign of the cross marking us as your own, we give you thanks. We give you thanks and praise, Lord Jesus Christ, that you have welcomed us at your table. We give you thanks. For the joy of worship with our brothers and sisters, we give you thanks. For the word proclaimed and heard anew week by week, we give you thanks. For hearing our prayers on behalf of the world, for those we love, and for our own needs, we give you thanks. For accepting our gifts and making them part of your eternal offering to the Father, we give you thanks for giving us a place within the awe-filled hymn of all creation. We give you thanks. For the regular remembrance of you, of your passion, death, and resurrection. We give you thanks. For the outward signs of the inward grace you so freely give into our hands. We give you thanks. For the peace that passes understanding and the joy of service. We give you thanks. And for those who ask for our prayers, for Kathy, safe travels, Glenda and Don, healing, Shirley, healing, uh, Reuben and Nuance and family, peace, Lori and Beth, healing, for Beth, Becky, hearing, healing, for Louisa, healing, for Jack, for prayers, for Sharon, healing, and for Jim, prayers. We pray for them, Lord, hear our prayer.
on the 27th, is that correct? Wednesday. Wednesday. And then delivered on the 28th. Right. So please, we thank all those involved with our backpack and it's starting up again. Also, the September has really gone by quickly <laughs> and it kind of sneaked up on us, to be honest with you, but yes, October 3rd, the first Sunday in October, is the Feast of St. Francis. So we will be having a blessing of pets, drive by, outside, 2.30 is the time I thought would be best. I did ask our friends at Martoma if they'd be using our space at that time. I had not heard back from them, but that's okay. We can still do an outside pet blessing at 2.30. Just come drive by with your pet or walk by with your pet. We're happy to provide a pet blessing. And I also, I know some people may not be too comfortable with this, but I'm going to go ahead and just leave it open to your decision. If you wish to name a pet, who have died recently in our prayers, the people you may do that. Also, some real exciting news. So you remember we had our Roof Angel, you saw the Roof News. Did everybody get a copy of the Roof News in your email? So we got a Roof Angel who anonymously gave us a $15,000 per dollar match to help us repair our roof. Happy to report. Are you ready? Thus far, we've raised fourteen thousand five hundred dollars. Now remember that clap. Because if you have something to give, you can still give it. If we go over our goal, great. We'll find a place for it. Trust me. But we do thank you all so much for your dedication and your generosity. So keep giving it. We'll take roof collections until the end of September. Also, be watching for our stewardship news tell beginning in October. This year we're doing some things a little differently with our stewardship pledge drive. Again, we're just asking you to please consider and pray about what you've been giving. To keep giving what you're comfortable giving. And you give a little bit more great, but the whole purpose of the stewardship drive is just to give to our church to help us with our mission. So we'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks, and I'm hoping, although I asked this person to come, this special guest to come many weeks ago, they have not yet responded that they can be here in our narthex as kind of a fun little way to remind us about our pledging. That's all I can say about that, so keep your interest. Let us walk in love, as God has loved us, and as Jesus has loved us, offered himself as sacrifice.
thanks to you, O oh God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophet, and above all, your word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, Mary to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before him you brought us out of error to truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died, our Lord gave us with bread. When he gave thanks, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given up for you. Do this for the remembrance. Church. 